20. Come and hear all, who, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened, and he has heard my prayer. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love for me. Amen. We welcome you to give your tithes and offerings this morning. There are two boxes in the rear, one at the main door and one to my right. And if you have tithes and offerings to give today, we invite you to do that. Uh, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we begin our services today. Father, thank you again for your presence as we've met together. We thank you for your faithfulness throughout the week. And we're trusting you, Lord, to bless the tithes and offerings today that are given. And the worship service and, and the ministry of our uh, minister today, we pray, Lord, that you be with Keith as he leads us. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness again. We're trusting you, Lord, to bless the service. And those who are worshiping with us, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will give guidance and direction. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. If you have your announcement sheets, we'll just go through a couple of the announcements here. 
Um, first of all, I want to uh, let everybody know on September 1st we'll have another baptism service. So if you're interested in being baptized, you can email or text Pastor Rachel and let her know. Or stop out at the, at the welcome desk and you can uh, let them know out there too. Um, secondly, uh, September 8th, three weeks from today, it's hard to believe it's almost September already, uh, will be Small Group Sunday. And we'll have sign-ups for all of our small groups out here in the foyer. And you can walk around and look and see what the offerings are for small groups and choose the one that's right for you. Uh, and then small groups will begin uh, later on that week or during that week. Um, as far as small groups go, I want to point out four new ones that will be starting in September. First of all, there will be a membership class. Uh, for those that are wanting more information about the Church of the Nazarene and uh, want to consider or make a decision on whether to join a church, uh, so there will be that. Uh, next, there's a newly married class. Uh, Pastor Rachel and Ben will be leading this group. Uh, and that'll be for couples that have been married for less than 10 years. So they're invited to, excuse me, they're invited to join that, uh, that small group. Um, there will also be one for first responders. Um, so if you're a first responder or a re retired first responder, uh, they're starting, starting a small group just for you, and that will be led by Jay Metz. Um, then there's also a first 40 days uh, small group. And this will be for those people that have been just been baptized, and it's an eight-week eight week long course. Uh, this will walk you through what's next and the what's next steps uh, for after baptism. And so all who have been baptized are invited to, uh, to take part in that. That'll be on Sunday morning after worship service, and that'll be led by Keith Little. Um, I do have one announcement that's not on the sheet. Uh, next Saturday... Uh, Pastor Rachel and family are going to be getting moved into their house up in Pennsylvania. So anybody that is available, willing, able-bodied uh, and can help with that um, can gather uh, to assist. That will be at 9 o'clock next Saturday morning and just moving them from the parsonage, uh, whatever they have in the parsonage, up to their, to their new, new place. And that's all the announcements I have. Good to be here today. Can you hear me? Oh, I got to go. There she is. Well, good seeing you. I got to go. <laughs> if you all didn't know, uh, I am a kid. And uh, I'm not used to this. Can you hear me? So to me, this is the elephant in the room now. I'm not used to that, so I'm going to ask for a little grace. Uh, Pastor Rachel has been doing this series on redirect, and uh, it's kind of it's kind of neat. And uh, last week she talked about Proverbs, and uh, the verses that she went over, and particularly she wanted to uh, emphasize was uh, verse nine, and it, it's allow God get into your heart. So we need to ask for that. And, you know, let's read Proverbs. And I like Proverbs because it things over and over again, and you kind of wonder about that. Why in the world would you repeat that over and over and over again? That's because we need to hear it over and over again. So uh, <clears throat> that's planting the seeds for redirecting our lives, and God wants to do that, and he has to do that by entering our hearts. So today we're going to look at Galatians. So if you want to look in through your Bibles there, uh, we're going to go to chapter 5, and we're going to go to verses 16 through 25. Talking about that. And today it's about uh, live by the Spirit. And that's what our, our message is basically today. <clears throat> so if you'll indulge with me, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day. Lord, we thank you for being a God that allows us to talk to you, to pray to you, to 
thank you for your son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Lord. Heavenly Father, the gift that was given through his death on the cross, Lord, to our rising him up from the dead, Lord, and Heavenly Father, the life that you had given us through that. We thank you for your spirit, Lord, that we're going to discuss today. We pray, Lord, that uh, you give me the words that I need to say, and I pray, Lord, that uh, it impresses upon your hearts and your minds. I pray, Lord, that if I say anything that comes from me, of me, or by me, that it falls to me and, and it's gospel. But I pray, Lord, that you bring us here. Help us, O oh God. I pray for all those that aren't here today that wanted to be. And I pray, Lord, that they can feel your peace and your presence wherever they are. And I pray, Lord, that they can hear your message as well. We thank you, God, for loving us first. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. And it's living by the Spirit. And that's our message. So without ado, let's get into God's Word. So it says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires, and since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Amen? All right, so live by the Spirit. What does that mean? What does it mean to live by the Spirit? It means living in obedience and holiness in response to God and in pace with Him. And by that, we're saying you don't want to live by the flesh. And it's easy to live in the flesh. It's all around us. We're, we're born into it every day. Every day, every day. You're bombarded. As soon as your feet hit the ground, if you turn on the TV, if you turn on the radio, you're bombarded by light. You know, people telling you what you need to buy, people telling you what you need to wear, what you need to think. You even have news stations now that give you the news slanted from their own uh, agenda. You know, it's, it's, it's terrible. This is the world that we're in. So I have to wonder, you know, it seems like we're the only ones that had to deal with this. You know, I, I sometimes I have to remind myself that every generation has had that its problems of the flesh. It's had its problems to deal with. And uh, we're not unlike many who lived long before us that had to deal with problems and issues. From the time the, of the beginning, there's been problems. Paul's pointing out the most egregious of the sinful acts, though. He's painting a picture because he wants it to be clear that this is the, this side of it. This is the bad. This is really bad. And that... You don't have to be a rocket scientist to listen to those things. And this is pretty bad stuff. I mean, it, it's, it's real obvious. And over here, on the good side of it, is what Jesus did for us. His teachings. All the things that he taught us. All the teachings that he gave us are the good. That's the, the two ends of the spectrum. This is how we should live. He taught us how to live. But it's very hard to get from here to here. We find ourselves living in the middle somewhere, in the gray area. And when we live in the gray area, sometimes we can get a little lost. We forget where the edges are, where the black and the white is. We forget where those edges are. And you get lost into that, and you get mired into it. And sometimes we can get confused in that. We can start to water down things to, to make it fit our own agendas. Living in the flesh, that's what the flesh does. 
That's what happened in the Old Testament over and over and over again. We've seen it. We've read it. And we think, wow, how, how come they didn't get it? You know, for me, Exodus is, is, is kind of amazing because they saw all those things. They came out of Egypt. They saw the plagues that God provided to get them freedom. They had a pillar of fire they followed by day or, or night. They saw it, and then you know, they had him there. They had God with them. He separated the water. They walked through water on dry land, and they turned around and watched Pharaoh's army get washed up. How is it that they got confused? How is it they got confused? I like the movie Charleston Heston. He goes up on the mountain. He gets the Ten Commandments. And he comes down. And just that quick while he was up there, it wasn't even one commercial in the movie. Not one commercial. They done built a golden calf. I thought, wow, how quick we lose. How we, we lose our track and lose sight of that. But the truth of it is, that's the truth. We lose sight of things. We come to church. We do the things we, we listen to the sermons, and then Monday we get up, we go to work, or we, we go mow yards if you're retired. <laughs> you know, you do these things, you get it back into your life, and hopefully, hopefully you're living by the Spirit. But if you're living by the flesh, by next Sunday, you need to come back in to get yourself back on track. And what God is saying, there's a better way, and Paul is pointing that out. There is another way to do that. You don't have to keep fighting this. You don't have to keep fighting the flesh, you have, you have someone to help you, and they provided that through the Holy Spirit. That's your helper, and that's what he wants you to get the message of today. Striving to become more like God. Now, to me, that's a lofty, a lofty request. You know, I, I, I've I think about that and I think, wow, I fall so short of the mark. I fall so short of the mark. You know, you try, we try to do the best we can, but there's always something that pops up and, you know, you feel a certain way about someone who cuts you off sometimes and, and suddenly this thought pops into your head, you know, well, I hope they catch the next red light or something. And you start thinking ill things, you know, and, and wow, where's that coming from? You know, that's, that's not what Jesus taught us to do. You know, that's still the flesh. We still have that fight going on. And take heart because we're not the only ones. If, if you're struggling with that, you're not the only one. You're in good company. Because even Paul talks about that. And he has struggles with that. Even Paul had struggles with that. I had a friend pointed out to me. We were just talking the other day about uh, Paul and Romans. And we were talking about Romans. And he's actually... A, a theologian, you know, he's a pastor, and, and uh, <clears throat> he went to school and all that. Disclaimer, I did not. <laughs> I did not go to school. Uh, but I know what I know that I know. And I know what I've experienced, and I know what I've seen. And I've seen some really cool stuff. I've seen stuff, stuff I can't explain. I can't explain it. I, you know, and it can only come from one place. And where does that come from? That comes from God. You know, that's a wow, that's amazing. I want that in my life. I've seen that in others, and I said, they got something going on that I want in my life, and I need to find out what that is. And you get a little closer to them, you come to find out what they have. And you say, I want that. That's what I want. I guess my knowledge and experience comes from hard knocks. And you, you tend to remember them a little more. But they hurt. They hurt. But Paul's saying that you don't have to do it that way. So anyway, my friend was telling me about Romans. And he said that uh, Paul struggles with this for seven chapters. You think, oh my goodness, it's like gloom and doom. You know, the law, the law, the law, this and that. You get beaten to death by the law in, in Romans. And he said, and then suddenly in chapter 8, he has these epiphanies. And he talks about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit helps us. And he said in chapter 8, I think it's chapter 8, he told me, he said, it's, it's like uh, 30 verses, and in 18, 18 times he mentions the Holy Spirit in, in like 30 verses. He says, it's amazing he got that in that many times. That's how important it is. 
You know, Ms. Rachel gave me a tough task <laughs> to talk about the bad things of sin and the nature of sin and, and where it comes from. You know, talk about the things that we really don't want to talk about. You know, the things that Paul pointed out, the things that are wrong in our lives, the things that we think about that are wrong in our hearts, the things that we act on that we shouldn't. We know we shouldn't, but yet we do it anyway. We're in the flesh. The things that we struggle with, and that's the things that I'm talking to you about today. But you have to understand that if you accept Christ in your heart, if you accept Christ in your heart, he lives in us. That's what Christians mean, right? Christ in, Christ in. He's in our hearts, so he's there. We have the biggest cheerleader of all. We have Jesus. If you truly believe, if you truly believe that he died for your sins and that he was risen from the dead, you have him in your heart. Paul says in Ephesians, you're sealed. Your heart is sealed. That's reassuring. That's reassuring. He owns you. He owns you. You're being freed from condemnation. I used to tell our Sunday school class, I said, in my mind, I have to paint mental pictures to get the image so I have to impress them in. I have this vision that when, when I go to heaven, I'm going to be standing there, and we're all going to be judged. You know that. Every one of us is going to be judged. And I'm going to be judged. And my accuser is going to be there pointing out the things in my life. And there's going to be this big screen TV there. And it's boom, boom. Remember that? Remember that? Bet you didn't think anyone saw that. <laughs> there it is. But I'm going to have Jesus with me. I got that. I got this. I got this. By my stripes, I am saved. And that's my desire for you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It gives us a desire for others outside of ourselves. Because living in the flesh is about me. It's about me. What I want, what I need, what my desires are. But Jesus wants us to think about others. He wants us to think beyond us. He wants us to get out of that mold and think about others. That's a, that's a sign of a changed heart. When you start caring about someone else, you start wanting to help someone else so that they don't fall down that path. That they have eternal life, that gift of eternal life. We need to have that for everyone because Jesus gave it for us. We are the whomsoevers. The whomsoevers. We are the whomsoevers. And we need to work on building the parts of our lives that please God. You know, not the things that discourage others, but we, we want to build up things that are pleasing to God. And it's really not that hard. We make it hard, we make it difficult, but it doesn't have to be that way. When we wake up in the morning, before our feet hit the ground, we can decide how we're going to face today. We get to make that choice. We can choose to look at it as a, my cup is half empty, my cup is full, or my cup is totally empty, but i got all these possibilities I can be filled with. We get to choose that. Or we can look at it in the negative light. We can look at it negatively. Woe is me. <laughs> Woe is me. I got all this stuff going on. We can get lost up in that. We can lose our way. And that's what Pastor Rachel was talking about, our GPS. The Holy Spirit can redirect our thoughts. It can redirect our life. And it doesn't mean that you're not a Christian to get lost. You can be a Christian and get lost in your way. You could be a Christian and not know what direction to go. The Old Testament is full of examples of that. Full of examples of that. We just talked about Moses. Here's a guy who was being cast away. Then he wound up going into uh, royalty. And then he had to leave royalty and go out into the wilderness. Then he had to come back and get his people up out of Egypt. Then he had to lead them into the promised land. There's a man that's been redirected. 
he was redirected many times. And he wouldn't be redirected if he wasn't open to what God had in store for him. He had to be open for the messages of God. Now, he didn't always get it right, but he was doing it. He was doing the best he can. And I think that's what God asks of us. Just do the best you can. Allow me to guide you, direct you. When I, uh, I first accepted God, I said, you know, I'm going to start doing stuff. I'm going to start, uh, Liam was talking about Sunday school classes. I thought, well, I'm going to go to Sunday school. I told Vic, I said, I want to go to Sunday school class. I want to learn a little more. I want to learn something. So I really didn't know where to go. I, I came in. I went downstairs. We went into the basement. And she was teaching the toddlers, and, and I didn't know what class to go to. And uh, I happened to uh, to come up to one, and, and she asked me uh, if I wanted a cookie. <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I'd like to have a cookie." So she invited me in to have a cookie, and I got into Sunday school class. And it wasn't long after that, God started asking me to do stuff. I didn't understand it, but I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to start saying yes to things instead of saying no all the time. I'm busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. I'm busy. You'd be surprised what all starts happening to you when you start saying yes. And God, the Spirit, starts guiding you into places that you thought you'd never be. And you start saying yes. And you trust into him and not into yourself. You never know where you're going to wind up. You could even be winding up here giving a message one Sunday because <laughs> the pastor asked you to. Okay. <laughs> okay. But we need to know that the thoughts come from the Holy Spirit and from God and not from us. That's the other thing we need to, to, to keep an eye on. What, you know, why are we doing this? Why do you want to do this? Do you want to do this because you want to reach the lost? Do you want to share with others? Are you trying to elevate your position in the church? You know, what, what is your motivation? If you can lie to yourself, but you can't lie to God. You know, he reads our hearts. He knows our minds. He knows what motivates you. He knows you. I mean, after all, he made you. He made you. He had a purpose for each of us. We're all uniquely made. That just blows my mind that how unique each of us as individuals are. I'm reminded over and over again, you know, we're uniquely made. Each of us have our own life experiences. Each of us got to where we are today by our own paths. We have skills. We have knowledge. You have wisdom, believe it or not. You have some wisdom. But God needs to redirect that because what the wisdom and the knowledge and the skills that we have are the things that we've done by our own hand. But he wants to be able to use that. He wants to use the things that, that your life experiences has taught you for his will. And that's where we're at today. Learning about God's will. What is his will for our lives? What does he want? You know, Paul points out the things that are wrong the bad things. He points that out. He pulls no punches. Like I said, they're rather egregious when you read those in the verses uh, uh, 17, I think it is. It's, it's pretty egregious. He points out the sin and the law that points out the sin. But the real important point here is the law points out the sin but does not help you overcome it. That's important to understand. The law only points out the things that are wrong. That's it. It points it out. You can't do this. You shouldn't do that. Don't do this. Don't go there. Don't do this. I don't know how you all were a kid. But when I was a kid, if you told me not to do something, I'm your huckleberry. <laughs> I want to know why. What's going to happen? <laughs> so, you know, I, I would try to find out. You know, it got me into some unusual situations, and most of which were trouble. <laughs> uh, I was very curious 
uh, very curious by nature. It was part of my nature, but you know, you learn a lot that way. And my dad's one arm was bigger than the other, and there was a good reason for that. <laughs> he got it worked out a good bit. Yeah, so uh, the law points out the things that are wrong, but it does not help you overcome it. Only the Holy Spirit can help you overcome the problems of the law, the, the things that the law points out. The Holy Spirit will help you with that. That's what its job is. It helps us overcome sin. It helps us to grow. It teaches us the things that we need to do, the things that we need to say, the, how we should feel. It teaches us that. Because what it does is it points out to us, it points out to us, you'll have this, this feeling like, oh, wow, I probably shouldn't have said that. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have treated them like that. Maybe I need to do something about that. It puts that nagging in our heart. Wow. Did you ever have a, a, someone pop into your head just for, you don't know why, just, they just suddenly pop into your head? That's the Holy Spirit. He's placing that person in your heart or in your mind for a reason. And then we have to learn to understand that and recognize it for what it is. And then we have to act on it. That's what, that's what Paul is talking about. Allowing the Holy Spirit to change us redirect your life. Sometimes we get lost. Like uh, I think of Jonah, he's probably the, the biggest one that jumps out of my mind that, that he was asked by God to do something he really didn't want to do. So he went to great lengths to get away from it and God went to even bigger lengths to get him back. And he chased after him. God did. He chased after him. And he eventually reluctantly went on into Nineveh. He did it anyway. And I tell people he preached the shortest sermon ever written. Repent or die. There God had did it. I'm done. And to his dismay, they repented. The Holy Spirit had already gone ahead and done the work. God just needed him to do his part. The shortest sermon ever written. Repent or die. And it worked. They repented. The whole town was saved. You know, God redirects us because he has a plan, and he wants to use us in his plan. He wants to use each of you in his plan. But he has to work on us first. He has to get our attention. I tell people, I, I said, with Z, I think he uses a big stick. <laughs> and I asked him for that. I said, hey, you need a big stick? <laughs> need to, to get me back and get me on track. Get me to do the things that you wish me to do. I'm going to read verse 18 again because it's kind of important. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So what does that mean? It means to be saved, we must have faith in Christ. To walk in God's way, we must have faith in the Holy Spirit, for he empowers us to walk in obedience. That's where that comes from. That's where that comes from. So I'm not going to dwell on all the bad things. That's easy enough to do. In my previous life, we were just talking about that earlier. It's it 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 easy to walk around the institution, and I, I was a philosophy. Is I managed by walking about. And what that means is I got out of the office. I have always told my secretaries, look, I got a phone. If you need me, give me a call. But I, I walked around the institution. I walk the floors, I walk the dining halls, I walk the institution, I talk to staff, I talk to the inmates. Managed by walking about. And the thing that I've really noticed through the years is that there's a lot of people that are willing to point out the problems that we have. The problems that we have in society, the problems that we had in the institution, the problems, there's, a, there's many people that are willing to point out problems. You know, at auditors, when they used to auditors come around, I thought, I hated audits. <laughs> They would come around and they would point out all the things that are wrong in your facility or all the things that are wrong in your business. That's what their job is. They point it out. But the people that I really liked were the ones that offered solutions. Someone who offers a solution. Anyone can point out a problem. Anyone can do that. But what we need is someone to say, hey, here's the problem, but hey, here's a solution to think about. 
there's an avenue to look at. And what God is saying, and what Paul is saying here, is there's solutions. There is a solution to this dilemma. There's a solution to the problem. And it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, everyone is a slave to something. Every one of us is a slave to something. It's either good or bad, but you cannot expect to harvest the fruit of God when you're sowing seeds of evil. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at this, and that's what basically Paul is saying. If you're living life like this, if you're living life over here on this end, you can't expect to harvest the fruit. You can't expect to be out there sowing seeds of good if you're out, you're out there doing bad. It's common sense. Unfortunately, it seems as though common sense isn't all that common anymore. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it seems to be lost. But again, if you read through the Old Testament, they had the same issue. They had the same issue. I mean, they had the, they had the tiger by the tail. But they, they still lost their way time and time again. We're no different. We can still lose our way. We can get lost. But with the Holy Spirit, it's our guide. It's our director. Freedom in Christ does not give us the right to do as we please, but the liberty to do as we ought to. You understand that? It doesn't mean that we can get out and do whatever we want. We do things because we want to. We want to please God. We want to please Jesus. I want him to be proud of me. I want him to say at the end of the day, well done. Well done. You ran a good race. You fought the hard fight. You were willing to say yes. When every instinct in your body said no, you were able to do it. You had the courage to open your mouth. I shared with you one time, and I, I had just joined CMA, and uh, I had some friends. We were going on rides, and ABATE is one of our, our local groups. Uh, Tuck, who's the director, was the director of ABATE. I actually grew up with him. And... Uh, my friends had invited me from CMA to go on this A-bait ride. It was called the Millie Run. They still have it. And uh, we went down here. It's a big event. It used to be a really big event. And uh, we met out here at the Del Mar. And uh, I pulled in. It was raining that day. And Vicki and I were on the bike. And Tuck, when I pulled in the parking lot, I said, oh, good, the CMA's here. He said, Sam is a, one of our, our leaders in the groups. They'd always told him that the first sea of mayor that pulls in does the prayer for the ride. And I laughed. <laughs> yeah, all right. And we went on in. That's funny. Because really, I hadn't really learned to pray yet. I knew how to say the Lord's Prayer, but that's about it. I, I didn't know how to pray to God. I really didn't know how to do that. And to do a corporate prayer over a couple hundred bikers. Well, that's out of the question. Yet there I was. And as many times in my life as where my CMA friends never left me down, I'm here to tell you today, they left me down. Not a one of them showed up. And I texted. Believe me, I was texting. Where are you at? <laughs> I called. No one answered. Where are you at? And then the time came. Tuck came and got me. Hey, we got to get this ride going. We need to start off with a prayer. I don't know when you were young if you ever really got in trouble. Y'all ever get in trouble? I had to go to the office a good bit when I was in school. I got to go to the principal's office a lot. <laughs> uh, and it never failed. It seemed like when you're walking down that hall when you were sent to the principal, it felt like your feet had cinder blocks on them. And heavy steps heading to this task. But I remember, I remember walking out there as Tuck was leading me, and I prayed a prayer. I said, Heavenly Father, I need your help. I don't know how to do this. 
but I'll try to have the courage to open my mouth, and I will trust you to give me the words I need to say. So we did. We talked, announced, see May's going to do the prayer, and I opened my mouth. And I remember saying, amen. And Tuck said, well, all right, very good. Pat me on the back, and away we went. I got on the bike, and we were going down the road. And two miles later, I leaned back and asked Vic, I said, what did I say? (laughs) I had no idea. But God gave me the words I needed to say. He gave me what I needed to say. And I learned in that moment to trust. I started to learn to trust and to have faith in that spirit. Like I said, God placed me in a lot of different places. I spent 37 years in a prison. I've seen things. I've seen things. I've heard things. I've seen dark things. I've seen light things. I've seen God working in places like that. I've seen healing in this very church. I've seen healing occur that defies explanation. You just can't explain that. I've seen things through CMA. I've seen lives changed. I've seen lives destroyed. I've seen God at work. I've seen what he wants to see. We see people that don't know God. And we, we've got to have a heart for them. And that's what he wants in us. He wants to be able to use you, but he needs you. He needs you to have his spirit in him so we're not in the flesh. And that's what this is about. He needs to change you. And he's not change you the way that the world does it, but to change the way that he wants to change you. And what he wants in me, he may not want in you. And what he wants to change in my life, he may not want to change in your life. And vice versa. There's a plan for each of us. We each have our own plan. We're all unique, remember? We're all uniquely made. I think uh, today as a people, uh, we've really lost our way. We really have lost our way. I think uh, we're, we're not as egregious as what maybe Paul has pointed out here. But we're right out there. We've come to be so much about ourselves and protecting what's mine that we've forgotten about others. You know, we, we got into this one-upmanship. I got to get ahead. It was ingrained upon us. We've been taught that way. As a society, we've been taught that way. We've been bombarded by it. And God says he wants something different in our lives. He wants something different for you. He wants you to see things the way that he sees things, not the way that the world sees it, but the way that he sees it. And we do that through the Holy Spirit. And the only way we can do that is to follow Jesus. I said earlier, we all have to be slaves to something. I guess uh, you have to choose your bondage as well. Make yourself a slave to Christ. He has the teachings. It's right there. He teaches us how to live our lives. He teaches us how to love others. There used to be a saying of something about uh, what would... uh, what would uh, what was the acronym? What would Jesus Christ do? <laughs> what would he do? You know, when we come up on a problem or a dilemma, maybe I don't know how to think about this outside of the world, but Lord, how do you want me to see this? What do you want me to see in this? Start praying your prayers. Hey, Lord, break my heart for the things that breaks your heart. Allow me to see the things that you see. Not look at the world through rose-colored glasses where it's sunny, always sunny, and the birds are always chirping, but let me see the things that you really see. Let me hear the things that you really hear. Break my heart for the things that breaks your heart. You want to catch sin early before it spreads like a cancer because it can eat away at you. Like I said, you start getting into that gray, and then before long, you you don't know which way to go. You're running around in circles. I can't find the edges. Where is the black and the white? Where are the edges? 
Trust in the Spirit. You know, He places people in your life. He places people around you that you can go to. Your small groups, your study groups, all those are relationships that you're building. By fellowshipping, you're building relationships so that when you get in trouble, you know where to go to. You've got somewhere to go. You've got someone I can talk to. You've got people that care about you. We're all family. Did you know that? My brother's mother's sister's cousin is related to your sister's aunt's brother's father, once removed. <laughs> We're all related. We're all one family. We're all one family. And as family, we look out for one another. Right? Amen? You get to choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. You're stuck with me, Miss Brendan. <laughs> You're stuck with me. Imitate Jesus in all you do. Everything you do, try to imitate Jesus. I want to be like you, Jesus. Teach me. Teach me your ways. That's what the Spirit provides us. Teach me your ways. I love the book of James. Anyone here ever read James? That is one of my favorite books. It's almost wore out here in my Bible. It's almost wore out. It is a great book. It points out. I mean, he pulls no punches. He literally doesn't step on your toes. He stomps on your feet. Whenever you feel a little haughty, a little high and mighty, read James. He reminds us what it means to be a Christian. What it means. What you represent. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. We're representing Jesus to the people that don't know him. So, so, I say all that to say this. If you're living in that part that Paul's talking about, you're not really representing Christ. If you're still living in the past, in the sin, if you're mired in the muck, you can't sow seeds. We've got to fix ourselves. We've got to redirect ourselves. If I want to represent Christ, I've got to make sure that I'm representing Christ, that he is actually in my heart, and the things that I say, the things that I do, the things that I think are representing what he represents. And if not, I need to work on that. And I need to work on it every day. And I'm no different than anyone else, or even with Paul. Paul struggles with that in every of the letters that you ever read. He still struggles with that. Because he knows he's still in the flesh. But he's trying to reach out to all the whomsoever's and represent the best he can. We want to run the good race, but remember, we're still going to make mistakes. We're still going to fail. I still say no when I should probably say yes. And sometimes I say yes when I should say no. <laughs> and the only way we can do that is to have the Spirit tell me, guide me, direct me. We have to involve the Spirit into everything, not just into the big things, but even in the little things. I heard Pastor Steve say at one time, you know, it's not like we're going to ride around the parking lot and pray to God to give me a good parking place. <laughs> It's, it's not like that. But we need to have him guide us and direct us. Teach me. Teach me the way that you want me to treat others. Teach me. You know, we were taught that when we were young. We were taught that. And most of this isn't a, a, you know, a big puzzle that has to be figured out. It's, it's, it's right there. It's, it's simple. God gives us through Jesus' his teachings, is uh, two rules. Two rules. Love God and love others. It's the greatest mission statement ever written. Love God, love others. Because if you're about to think, say, or do something that doesn't support that mission, then you probably shouldn't think, say, or do that. If the things that I'm about ready to think, say, or do doesn't reflect loving God, and I should not do that. If the things that I think, say, or do is not showing love for others, then I really shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be thinking that. I shouldn't be doing it. You say, well, sometimes we think about things. But did you know that when you think about things, you're dwelling on them, and eventually, eventually, the thing, one of the things that James talks about, it comes out in your tongue. It'll come out. It will betray you. Trust me. It will betray you. Your tongue 
is, a, is one of the worst tools that the devil has. That little tongue right there is a bad little thing. It will betray you, I'm telling you to the quick. And once it's out there, you can't get it back. It's out there. So just remember, you know, we, as much as we want to change our lives, we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to help change our lives. We need that wisdom of God. We need that direction from God. We need him to bring things to our attention. Like I said, you know, we're, we're to be ambassadors for God. And that's kind of hard to do in today's world. It really is the way things are set up and all that. But, it, but it's not. We were all taught. As I look around this room, I'm pretty sure you all went to kindergarten. How many here went to kindergarten? You all went to kindergarten? We were taught. We were taught things in kindergarten that there were life's lessons. There's a book out there. It's an old book. It's been around for a while. It was written by Robert Bolden. And I want to share this with you before we close. It's, it says, most of everything I really ever really need to know, I learned in kindergarten. And that's the basis of his book. I, I, I encourage you to look it up and read it. It's a really good read. But I want to share with you a couple thoughts that he taught in his book about what we were, to remind you of what we were taught in kindergarten. You were taught to share everything. We share everything. We play fair. We don't hit people. We put things back when we're done with them. We put them back where we found them. We clean up our own mess. We don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt someone. Wash your hands before you eat. Blush. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. It's simple. It's simple. That's how we need to live our lives. We need to uncomplicate them. We did that. We made them complicated. We need to ask to, for God to, to bring that calmness into our life, that peace into our life. We need to reflect. We need to take time out. I had a time out last week. I had COVID. <laughs> I got a time out. So, wow, I just got to sit here, huh? <laughs> a time out. We need to take a time out and reflect. We need to listen for God's voice. We need his direction in our life. And hopefully you want him to break your heart for the things that break his. Hopefully you'll have a heart for the lost. Hopefully you'll want to take the messages you learn in here and take them out in there into the world and share. Remember the song, I want to let my little light shine. We don't want to hide it under a bushel basket. No, I want to let it shine. That's the spirit. We want to allow others to see the spirit in us. So reflect on that today if you would. I'll ask the worship team to come up, I guess. And, and uh, well, just, just allow the Spirit to change your life. Allow Him to talk to you where you need to be talked to. Allow Him to guide and direct you. And, and just trust into Him. And if you don't know that, this is a perfect place to pray. Come to Him. If you have somewhere in your life that you're struggling with, this is a perfect place to do it. You're with friends. You're with family. Everyone wants to see you succeed. Everyone, particularly him. Amen? God is good all the time, isn't he?
after I get to close this out in prayer, or a blessing, as Miss Rachel says. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, as, as we leave this place, Lord, that your light would be shining in us, and others would see that light, and that we would have the courage and the discipline to speak of your love for us. We pray, Lord, that you do break our hearts for the things that break your heart, Lord, and Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would allow us to see the way that you see things, Lord, and the way that you see the world. And it's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.